Hi, this is Ellie Tahoney with Research America. Thanks so much for joining us today um, for Partnership Progress Pandemic, the impact of COVID-19 on medical discovery. Um, we're working hard, and I know you are too, to raise awareness about the need to reignite broad-scale public and private sector-fueled medical progress. Um, that's what today's discussion is about, uh, knowledge fuels action, we need it um, very much to overcome cancer and other health threats that disrupt and take lives as surely as COVID-19 does. Um, I'd like to draw your attention to the chat box where there are a couple links. Um, there are links to our speaker bios, um, an infographic we put together deconstructing, oh Lord, I hate that word, sorry, um, but deconstructing the biomedical R&D pipeline um, and a report by ITIF, the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation, um, that provides some context on a mechanism that may be less visible um, than some others, but that plays a pretty catalytic role um, in seeding uh, medical progress, and that's the Bidol technology transfer pathway. It's um, gonna be one of the topics in today's uh, discussion. You'll also see a question box. I hope you'll use it um, anytime, type in questions, and we'll try to, for sure, make time to get to those questions during the course of the discussion. Um, it's my pleasure now. Oh, you know, I want to take one more second just to thank a couple of our congressional champions, uh, representatives to get and Upton for their work on all fronts um, to try to provide relief for the um, grant dollars that were lost during COVID-19, the ongoing threat, um, their work to fuel private sector science. Um, just generally, they've just been doing a spectacular job to speed medical progress, and I did want to acknowledge them. And so many others, Dr. Collins and all the institute directors, um, Dr. Sharpless and all, for all of their hard work um, on behalf of this issue. Um, I'll stop there and let me introduce today's moderator, um, Dr. Suda Parikh. Suda is the CEO of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, AAAS. He's also the executive publisher of Science, Family of Journals. Um, and I'm thrilled to say Sudip is also a Research America board member. And over to you, Sudip. Thank you. Thank you, Ellie. Uh, good, good afternoon, everybody, uh, and, and welcome to our discussion. Thank you for taking the time to join us. Um, you know, COVID-19 has changed the, not just the R&D landscape, it's changed everything, right? I'm, I'm working out of my basement. This looks like a closet, but it, it's my basement. And uh, it's, it's changed just the, the course of everything in our lives. Um, and in the R&D landscape, it's, it's put a stop to many of the things that were ongoing. Many of the things that we were most excited about five months ago are still happening uh, or are frozen in place and have to be thawed and, and, uh, and restarted. And so our focus today is going to be on those things outside of COVID-19 uh, that, um, that need to keep going because, frankly, they are also public health emergencies. And, uh, and we want to make sure that as the research enterprise uh, starts to thaw, starts to come back, uh, come back to its full strength, uh, that we've done the right policy making and the right priority setting uh, to, get us, uh, to get us to the right place. Uh, because threats like cancer, Alzheimer's, and heart disease haven't gone away. Uh, the R&D the infrastructure is multidimensional. Uh, it is the bricks and mortar of labs and clinical trial sites and manufacturing. It's the people uh, from, uh, from the graduate student to the postdoc to the PI uh, and, uh, and even to the tech transfer uh, professional, all the way to the, uh, uh, to the group that is looking at the regulatory pieces for how you get a drug into, um, uh, into somebody's hands. Uh, it's also the the mechanisms that empower and incentivize invention, right? So it's the federal grants that come from places like NIH. It's the tr technology transfer pathways that were outlined in by Dole. Uh, and then it's the investment climate itself. It's the, the folks who provide the dollars outside of federal grants. Uh, and uh, do they feel like there's, uh, like there's still opportunity? And you know, one of the questions we're gonna ask today is how has COVID-19 affected this complex infrastructure? And what's it going to take to get it restarted and uh, going as just as strong as it was before? Uh, I think we all can recognize it's going to take a, an effort that's uh, multi-sector, uh, uh, multi-government, multi uh, state, local, national, uh, to get this research enterprise started back up. And, and data is being collected at many different levels. Uh, but one of the first questions I'm going to ask you is I'm going to do a little bit of data, uh, data work here is how much do you think it's going to cost to get us um, to get the research enterprise going again uh, from COVID-19? 
And uh, I'll tell you that the dollar amount that we're looking for is one that has been uh, uh, put together uh, by the, the folks who work in universities. So we're talking about the academic setting here. Uh, what, how much do we think it's gonna cost uh, to get started again? I'm told I can make this poll work. So I hope, I hope you all can see this. I'm launching a poll on your screens. Uh, I am, uh, I'm a famous technophobe. So hopefully you see what will it cost to ramp up R&D again. And you can select one of the following. Uh, please, uh, please take your pick. And uh, I am going to start. I'm going to give you just another couple of minutes. I see about uh, about 60% of you have voted so far. All right. So a good number of you have voted. So uh, I've closed the poll now, and we should. I think. Oh yeah, I get to share results. There we go. Uh, so these are these are your answers. Now uh, this is a non-scientific poll, and uh, but you are you're coming in at numbers that come uh, that certainly center around uh, the numbers that uh, the universities have come up with. Uh, you've uh, it looks like we've got 36 percent at 26 to 50 billion, and 20 and 36 uh, percent at 11 billion to 12, 25 billion. Uh, the, the number that the universities have come up with is around $26 billion uh, just to get started again. And that, there's a lot in that number. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hide those results now. And, uh, and thank you for, for participating in that non-scientific poll. Uh, and now I'm going to uh, actually turn us to uh, the folks who can have a discussion about not just the dollars, but some of the policy things that are important as well. Uh, so I think we're going to have a, a great conversation, and we're going to have your questions uh, as the as the time goes on. So please uh, please have those at the ready. Uh, joining us today uh, is uh, is Dr. Ned Sharpless, director of the National Cancer Institute at the National Institutes of Health. Uh, Heather Pierce, who's the senior director for science policy and regulatory counsel at the AAMC, American Associate sorry Association of American Medical Colleges. Um, and Jenny Larray, uh, who is Vice President of Strategy and Communications at Research America, and uh, Dr. Eleanor Perfetto, who I think is on the phone. Uh, you probably don't see her, but she's on the phone, who is Executive Vice President of the National Health Council. Uh, I want to thank you all for being here. If uh, For those of you who would like uh, to look at their, uh, uh, at their bios, uh, they are shared in the reminder email that was sent for this, uh, for this broadcast. So please have a look at that reminder email. All right, let's get started. Uh, let me get just kick it off with a question for all of you, which is that clearly the social distancing uh, imperative associated with COVID-19 has had a huge impact on the R&D pipeline. And with the question I'm gonna ask each of you from your different prisms of, uh, of federal research, academic research, tech transfer, clinical trials and patients is what have been those impacts on the R&D pipeline from COVID-19 uh, from uh, from the sector in which you uh, in which you work, and I'll start with you, uh, Ned. If you'd like to start, that'd be that'd be great. Sure, it's um, <clears throat> you know, it, it, we've never had anything like this. I mean, this has been an unprecedented time for our nation and and for the NIH, and uh, so there's no sort of you know game you know playbook for a national pandemic of, of this scale. Uh, and, and by the way, I, before I answer your question, I would like to point out on against that backdrop of a terrible global pandemic, we've had uh, unprecedented uh, turmoil in American society related to the murder of George George Floyd, and this has been really tough on the NCI. I mean, we we, we care a lot about the topic of disparities and racial quality in the United States, and we have a lot of employees that are really racially diverse, and so it has provided an additional significant and unbelievable challenge to an organization that was already going through a global pandemic. But having said that, um, I, I make one remark: is that the, the the business, you know, half of the business of the NCI is giving out grants, is dispersing funds to great scientific endeavors. And that we can do pretty well teleworking. So we've been fully teleworking since mid-March. Uh, and despite that, I think the ability to review grants and uh, you know find great science and disperse funds, that pre proceeds at a, a good normal pace for us. Intramurally at the NCI, there's been some disruption for the wet bench scientists haven't been able to come to work. So we're actually resuming some modest return to work next week. So the bench scientists are finally getting back. Uh, we, we believe a lot of our scientists have been able to work um, at home or remotely on data analysis or writing grants or writing papers. So we think this time for some has been productive, but it's not the same as actually getting in the lab and it has been inconvenient. 
And then maybe the final thing I'll mention about the challenges of this, this era has really been related to clinical research, where we see a dramatic decrease in accrual to clinical trials, both in industry and in the trials that we sponsor at the NCI. The way this works is that, you know, the, the, the rate of new drug and new therapy approvals at FDA is directly related to how quickly the trials accrue and close and, and, and read out new data. And so we're going to see the effects of 2020 linger for a long time, we think, in new development for new therapies for cancer. So, you know, those have been the most immediate repercussions is, uh, you know, we can do the grant, do the grant making, but the actual research itself and then the clinical research has been somewhat debilitated. But, uh, but I am starting to see, you know, shoots of life reemerge. I'm talking to a lot of academic fundees and they're talking about their return to work policies and they're starting to reprioritize grant, uh, clinical trials again. And so th there is uh, some hope in the air at the moment, I would say. That's great. Thank you. Uh, we'll come back to some of those points that you uh, that you hit on uh, as we go deeper into the conversation, because I think you you really uh, you, you nailed uh, at least three or four of the points that I know we want to we want to get to. Uh, next, I'll turn to Heather. You know, talking. Ned mentioned that the grants are going out the door. Uh, uh, they're going to uh, some of the folks at the uh, the academic research centers that that uh, that you work with. Uh, what, what's the, what have been the effects? Well, the uh, COVID-19 has had a profound impact on, on all of us, on all sectors, but on the academic research side of things has get, gotten hit particularly hard. And that goes all the way from the basic fundamental research uh, through preclinical animal research and clinical trials with human subjects. Every, every sector and every piece of research has really been, been affected, um, of course, as, as the virus spread as the hospitalization and case rates went up and states started to shut down so did labs and that was a a very fast process of in a very short amount of time entire academic medical centers but also individual labs and investigators had to decide what was critical research that would go on during the pandemic and how that would happen and and for the major percentage of the research that was not considered essential or continued during the pandemic how would it be shut down in a way that it could come back again and so right now we are in this this pivot point and i think ned you pointed to that as well where we've moved from how do we shut down in an orderly way to how do you start research back up again and it's not just flipping a switch that there is uh, first of all people left people are um, you're in your basement i'm in my home office and uh people went all over the country so how are people getting back to campus and how does that play in the the landscape of this virus, which is very different state to state and geographic region to geographic region. We have places where cases are going down and places where, where cases are spiking. That's going to affect who gets into the lab and, and how and when. As we begin this startup again, uh, depending on the type of research, there are a lot of considerations that are both time consuming and expensive. Uh, so how do you restart where you where you left off? What kind of materials need to be replenished? And many labs donated all their personal protective equipment to the hospitals and the point of care centers. That needs to be replenished at a time when we still have a shortage of, of pr protective equipment. Um, animal colonies were, were um, shut down and sometimes moved, have to be started up again. And, um, and the effect on clinical trials was significant. The last piece that I'll, I'll mention here, and I know we'll talk more later, is that as these labs reopen, one of the priorities of academic medical centers and, uh, and teaching hospitals is to continue to protect the staff, the investigators, the trainees as they come onto campus and come into the the labs and how do we how do we do that what will be those protocols will we try to maintain social distancing in these labs that don't have much space anyway for moving around will there be testing for um for covid 19 and uh and how will we how will we respond to the the changing uh profile of this virus which is not going just in one direction 
So we may we may be at a place, whether it's six weeks or a month or three months or six months from now, where we are starting to move back into the shutting down or partially shutting down in areas uh, to protect the health of all the, the researchers as well. Yeah, thank you, Heather. Uh, that, uh, for those of us who aren't uh, in the lab every day, uh, can you draw the connection between that that twenty six billion dollar figure and the 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 activities you just mentioned, right? So you talked about uh, lab animals that have to be recreated and, and that sort of thing. It, it, there's a significant cost to that, right? That's not just um, uh, getting an animal. That's right. All of these all of these uh, aspects have have cost to them um, uh, certain reagents and have shelf lives. So things that have been sitting in the lab need to be need to be replaced. There may be new uh, new training that's used. This the other thing that is in, in really critical is that the Office of Management and Budget allowed certain uh, agencies to take certain flexibilities with their grantees during the pandemic. Thank goodness, right? And some of those things include the ability to pay researchers off of the research grant during this hiatus time. And so that means we can keep our researchers employed and they can keep, they are still grant funded while the research is halted. But the fact that the research has halted, but the money is still being spent down off the grant means the, the money that was intended to, to make science happen is disappearing. That needs to come back too. We need to understand how do we continue to fund the research as we've been spending down the uh, the grant money keeping the salaries of those individuals intact. Great, yeah, we're going to come back to more of those connections. Thank you, uh, Jenny. I'll turn next to you. Uh, you know, once it, once uh, discovery has, has come out of the academic medical center or the NIH, uh, it's got to make its way through uh, through tech transfer and into the into the private sector investment pool. Uh, what what do what's been the effect on that from COVID nineteen? Well, the good news is that there was a lot of really amazing technology already in the pipeline. Um, but the bad news is one of the things that Heather alluded to, and also Dr. Sharpless, is the complete disruption in human clinical trials. And a lot of the smaller biotechs um, take that on um, after they've you know, licensed um, research and technology from academia uh, under the Bayh-Dole Act. So, that has been very disruptive. Um, and interestingly, or maybe not so interestingly, um, companies that are focused in the respiratory space have really been particularly hard hit. So if you're researching emphysema um, uh, or asthma, the clinicians you need um, for your, your whole R&D process are in the ICU. So directly involved in COVID. Um, uh, but I think that what's key, and I know we're going to come to this uh, in a bit, Sudip, is that the the tech transfer um, ecosystem that we have in the U.S. that's not only by Dole but also Stevenson Widler, which covers our intramural research across the government, um, is really going to be critical um, as we get our footing moving forward. And it's been critical now in addressing the pandemic, allowing for all sorts of partnerships to take place. Um, between the private and public sector, between the private sector and academia, and I think it's going to make it, it it'll be pivotal uh, moving forward. It, we can talk more about that. Great, thank you, thank you, Jenny. Um, Eleanor, are you able to hear me? Eleanor Perfetta, are you there? All right, you know these uh, uh, these these uh, video conferences. I've learned that uh, that pretty much every time something something doesn't quite work for me so i'm going to come back to eleanor if she's uh, if she's there uh, to talk more about clinical trials and philanthropic investment uh, ned you you mentioned uh clinical trials and just that that that's where some of the biggest impacts have been um in terms of uh in terms of dollars does that um is that one of the biggest chunks of what it's going to take to restart the uh the the process of getting uh uh, you know, there are clinical trials on the NIH side, which are research clinical trials, and then there are clinical trials for moving to the private sector to, to get uh, get drugs into the pipeline. Um, is that the most expensive component of getting things started again? Is that it seems like a big deal? It is an expensive for the. I mean, I I won't 
try and comment on what that's costing big and small pharma. I think, you know, uh, my interactions from industry drug development suggest that clinical trials referral is very, very significant and perhaps the largest expense of that business model. But at the end, in NIH, um, you know, I, I have a pretty good idea of what, what this is costing the NCI, for example, and it, it is very significant. And it was to the point Heather alluded to that we, in many instances, still have to disperse the funds to keep these clinical trial infrastructures afloat. Uh, so they're still going on, but they're not accruing anybody or they're accruing at one half the rate that they normally would. Uh, so those personnel costs mean will come back to us in 2021 or in some other out year because the uh, trial will be extended to, to fully accrue. We'll also have some trials that just never finish, that don't accrue because the pandemic is just going to close them. Unfortunately, I hope that doesn't happen very often, but inevitably that will happen. And that's uh, you know not a good use of resources for trials that never accrue and never finish. And then we're also going to have trials that take a lot longer. Uh, and that, that extra period that it takes, you know, you can really just add that up with the, you know, the per patient accrual costs will stay about the same, but the duration will increase. And so you can figure out those costs and this be very significant. You know, Congress has been discussing uh, in their fifth supplement, the idea of giving some uh, funds to the NIH for restart costs. And uh, clinical trials accrual along with training and scientific restart costs would be the major things that we had in mind. That's it. We know from other sorts of, you know, smaller kind of disruptive events like this, that the, the, there's always a, a cost when you resume business as normal. Uh, we think this will be like nothing we have, we've ever seen before, but um, we, are, we are planning for that now as to how to support these trainees that have extended deadlines, how to get these clinical trials done that haven't been accruing, how to resume lab function and recreate the missing animals and the missing mice. And, and of course, you know, everybody's been paying personnel costs all along for the reasons that we mentioned. So um, there, there will be a number of expensive parts about restarting science. Uh, but I think, um, you know, cancer is a really important problem. It's not going away. And uh, we really have made great progress in cancer the last couple of decades. We don't want to see that overturned or undermined by this pandemic disruption. So, you know, the sooner we can get back to normal, the better we feel. Thank you. Uh, uh, Eleanor, are you able to hear me now? Uh, I, I hope you can hear me now. I can hear you. Yes. Uh, I was going to turn to you uh, to talk a little bit right. about clinical trials and, uh, and philanthropic investment and the effects of COVID-19 there. Uh, and maybe even talk a bit about if there's been any innovation because of the um, because of what's happened. Yeah. Eleanor? Sure. Thank you. I'm sorry about my technical problems today. You can hear me okay? We can. Sudeep, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, good. I'm sorry. I didn't think you could. Um, thank you so much. Um, so I just wanted to talk a little bit about what's going on with uh, the funding of research by patient advocacy organizations. Um, as you can imagine, with the COVID-19 and the, and the economic downturn that we've all experienced, um, many of the uh, patient advocacy organizations that would typically fund quite a bit of research um, are finding that they are facing large revenue shortfalls. So um, if you're an organization and you are dependent upon um, things like galas and runs, fun runs and walks and things like that to bring in funding and revenue, and all of that um, pretty much vanished overnight, um, you will have to cut back on the amount of new funding that you're initiating or um, cutting back on even awarded funding. And even though these organizations have begun to turn to virtual fundraising events, um, that is happening, it's being planned, things that were postponed are now turning to virtual, um, it's very likely to generate much less revenue than it would have in the past and certainly isn't going to help them recoup what was lo lost entirely. So um, keeping in mind that um, these are uh, patient groups that very often are funding uh, research in disease areas that doesn't get very much attention. They, that it, these are areas that are sometimes the, the patient group is the only one that's funding the research there for extremely rare diseases, or they're actually doing um, new investigator uh, kinds of research, or new, new investigator kind of funding to get new investigators interested in studying that disease area. Um, these are uh, grant areas that would come from these types of organizations that we can see uh, experiencing some pretty dramatic cutbacks in the coming year because of the, uh, the, the issues that are going on with the organization itself. So it's not for lack of 
of um, still wanting to be involved in investing in these research projects. It's a matter of the organizations being able to survive themselves as not-for-profit organizations that are heavily dependent upon charitable contributions um, and philanthropic dollars. So uh, it's very likely that we're going to see uh, some some issues in this area, especially with new grants not being initiated when the funding that is coming in is revenue that's going to be used toward keeping existing research projects going when possible. And you know, our my colleagues have spoken about the the problems that are going on there with existing clinical trials and many other kinds of studies having to be shut down. I think there is a silver lining, and I think that that is that we are figuring out new ways to do trials so that we can um, make it so that patients don't have to report to a clinic quite as often where uh, or we've been catapulted into the future when it comes to telehealth and telemedicine. So we went from having a toe in the water to being up in our, up to our eyeballs, which um, for, for most patients is actually quite a good thing. And it can really make us think about how we should be doing research very differently um, so that we can capitalize on the technology that we have so that we can make the activity um, less burdensome and easier for patients and, of course, safer pa for patients in the long run. So um, while we are seeing some of these dramatic issues with research cutbacks happening, we also have a great opportunity that we can take advantage of and think about new ways to do clinical trials and uh, reduce that burden on patients, which uh, we, we could have done a better job of before we got nudged into it. I'll stop there and... Thank you, Eleanor. Uh, you know, you, you mentioned something. That I, I, I read a I read a piece in um, in, in I think it was the New England Journal uh, last week, uh, and one of the one of the sentences that really caught my eye was that um, what COVID nineteen has shown us is that um, systemic change is possible overnight in terms of clinical trials uh, and in terms of the um, you know implementing things like paying for telehealth um, uh, overnight. Uh, Ned, have there have been other other you know I don't call them silver linings, but have there been other innovations that have uh, that have come out of, of having to work in this in this environment? Yeah, no, I I I, I have been using the word silver lining. I mean, I, I think there are some things where oh, I hope we don't forget some of the things we've learned during the pandemic. Uh, we've learned we can work really fast on certain topics. We cleared some scientific co concepts for uh, external funding in like days. And that's typically a year and a half kind of exercise for the NCI. So to be able to move that quickly when we need to, it's good to know. Clinical trials has been an area where, you know, right away, early on when this, this pandemic became, it was clear it was going to affect accrual. But the NCI and the FDA immediately released guidance for cancer clinical trials about what a protocol deviation was during COVID-19. You know, greater flexibility about getting your care at a site. If, if you didn't want to go all the way into Manhattan for obvious reasons, you could go to a hospital in Long Island and, and get your care there. So that normally wouldn't have been allowed by the protocol, but we allowed flexibility in where care was given and where samples were collected and, uh, you know, flexibility around the topic of, of deviations. And I think that was really important. I think also, you know, we were already very much moving in the direction of central IRBs, but institutional review boards, but this finished that off. I mean, because we had to open some trials at many, many sites very, very quickly. And uh, if you weren't using a CRB, a central IRB, you would be left behind in that process. So I think that was not a bad thing for our field. I, I, I keep saying over and over again, I, I hope the NCI doesn't forget, you know, some of the things that we've learned during the pandemic, because I don't want to go back to the, the days when it took us 18 months to open a clinical trial or get a new concept out the door. I think our patients don't want that either. I think telehealth is really here to stay, including, you know, consenting for clinical trials by telehealth. You just have to come into the doctor and sit down with a nurse or a doctor and, and talk to them about the clinical trial. A lot of that can be done over the web or by phone. So, you know, I, I think the pandemic has forced us to be flexible and innovative, and uh, I, I hope that sticks. A lot of that will have to do with payer decisions. I, I think we all were happy to see CMS, you know, Seema Verma saying she doesn't want to go back to the bad old days either. So I think that was a, a welcome sign from the leading payer of the United States. But uh, yeah, no, th there have been, uh, you know, some things about clinical trials and how we do science in general that have been beneficially affected by this uh, overwhelming public health disaster. Sudip, if, if yeah, I can please. chime in. Yeah, um, please. And Ned is well aware of ACTIVE, um, which you know is just an example of really creative and in many ways ground, ground, groundbreaking um, collaboration between government and the private sector. Um, and you know, you've got 
all the key HHS agencies plus the FDA and more than five large, you know, publicly traded um, biopharma companies looking at vaccine trial designs, data sharing, efficacy studies. So I think that's also a silver lining in terms of uh, the speed with which these partnerships have come together. Um, and hopefully, you know, it, there will be models that we will be able to take into the future. And, and I think we really will. That's so deep, I would add, so deep, this is Eleanor. I just wanted to add to that because I think, um, I think one of the things, you know, it, when Ned referenced him, he hopes that the NCI um, retains its memory on some of these things. And I think um, one of the things that I would also like to see is other government agencies thinking about how, you know, we've had a major natural experiment that's happened where we did things in some pretty different and dramatic ways. And we also need to think about in terms of research, how do we study um, what happened in so many different ways and how do we leverage that? So, you know, what can CMS be doing and CMMI and, and you know, other organizations in thinking about um, not just clinical trials, but, but research on, you know, what, what are all those new things that we started doing or faster things that we started doing? Um, and even in terms of the outcomes that patients have been experiencing because of the telehealth shift. You know, do we see different outcomes? Are they better? Are they worse? Are they the same? Uh, there are gonna, there's going to be so many learnings from this, and we need to have an intentional effort that focuses on what those learnings are. And I know um, yesterday, Senate Health Committee had um, some discussions on how do we uh, learn from the, te the telemedicine and telehealth issues. But um, I think it's not just telemedicine and telehealth. It's also um, other things that, that we could learn from in this regard that, that get even beyond that because it's been such a wide-ranging uh, space of things that have happened. Heather, the academic medical centers are at the center of, of, of both those lines of thinking. Uh, it, are there... Um, uh, are there learnings that uh, that the academic medical centers have have, uh, have pulled together uh, that they want to make sure they memorize? Absolutely. And the unique position of the academic medical center is that we're really living at the at the intersection of research and clinical care, um, and medical education and, and the trainee pipeline for researchers too. So all of these are happening at the same at the same time at the same at the same place. I too hope that we take the things that work and keep them going. I also worry uh, sometimes that things that we put in place quickly for expedience sake because we had to uh, make sure that, that we make sure that we revisit those and make sure that in regular times the speed at which we took some steps or the uh, the oversight that we decided to that we didn't need as much uh, that we take a close look at those and make sure that as we're moving forward, that we that we ensure that those those aspects of of telehealth that we brought in to research for consent and all, a lot of other parts of clinical trials are being done in a way that really meets our highest standards of of ethics for all clinical trials going forward. Um, but I think that I think that there is a lot that we have shown ourselves that we can do, that we can do faster, that we can do collaboratively, um, and that we can do remotely. Uh, I, I think that this this pandemic would have been a very different experience 20 or 30 years ago. The technologies that we have now that allow people to connect uh, with each other uh, should should really drive us going forward. Thank you. Um, I want to go back to a point that uh, that Eleanor brought up, uh, which is that uh, the the patient advocacy organizations have become uh, funders uh, in the biomedical research enterprise. And um, for those of us who are not uh, steeped in this, uh, maybe uh, Ned and Eleanor, Ned first. Um, how, how do they complement each other? Right. Uh, the NCI is a five. I, I can't remember now. Five or six billion dollar uh, funder. Um, uh, whereas the the patient advocacy organizations are relatively small funders, how do they how do they complement one another? I mean, they're they're really important for a number of reasons. I think the you know the first of all, it has to be said the NCI, you know, our pay lines, just our ability to fund the grants we receive are are, are very low compared to the rest of the NIH. There's been this massive increase in submissions to the National Cancer Institute in the last decade, and 
uh, for a lot of good reasons. There's a lot of exciting science in cancer and a lot of people moving our field, but it means our pay lines, this is the best year they've been since I've been at the NCI and they're 10%, you know, one in 10. So that's pretty lousy. Uh, you know, more typical would be, you know, 20%. So um, I, I think that the, the foundations have a very vital role to pick up some of that great science that we can't get to particularly for early stage investigators. So that's a really, um, it's very hard to get your first R01, your first you know, workhorse grants out of, out of the NCI. And I think, you know, uh, some of these cancer foundations that are interested in specific diseases or cancer at large uh, really uh, are, are just what keep a lot of junior faculty going in that difficult period when they sort of between the end of their startup package and the beginning of having NIH funding. So they're vital for that reason I, I, in that transition. They also fund, you know, areas that, uh, for whatever reason, the, the NIH hasn't prioritized, the NCI hasn't prioritized, and so, um, you know, that, that can be very successful for us. So we have ongoing conversations with uh, these sorts of funders to decide if we can co-prioritize an area, or occasionally we'll pick up two-thirds of a grant, and they'll pick up the last piece, and it's something that we can't fund for whatever reason. So, uh, and they, they also have some flexibility around their funding that the NIH doesn't have. So, for example, uh, the topic of uh, underrepresented minority scientists is hard for the NIH to take on. We're, by federal law, we can't predicate a grant on gender or race, but uh, foundations can. They can say we want to fund women scientists or we want to fund African American scientists, and that's laudable and good, and we applaud that. Uh, so they have some flexibilities we don't have. I think they've been very hard hit by this pandemic. I think what we heard before about not having the, the walk for cancer and the, for the gala fundraiser, that is real. Uh, and my big worry about that is the, the junior people, that there are a lot of early stage, you know, late stage postdocs and early stage faculty who are going to be short funded or just have their funding from these foundations cut. The NCI is thinking about things that we can do. I suspect we will come up with some sort of announcement for fundees caught in this gap. Uh, that's exactly what I need startup funding from Congress or restart funding from Congress for is that kind of an effort because I think that could be a very significant amount of trainees that would otherwise really have their training wrecked. And, and, and you know, we talked about the, the personnel part of this as being a really big component. And I, I want I to turn to industry here in a second, but uh, just before doing that, uh, Heather, have the, have the medical, uh, have the academic medical centers uh, been thinking about what this does to those young uh, career scientists um, uh, that are, uh, does it slow down their progression? Uh, how can how can we ensure that they stay on the path to tenure? Those sorts of things. Uh, that's a that's that's a big worry for uh, for science for junior scientists. It, it absolutely is, um, and it, I think that that the academic medical centers and the the AMC are very concerned and um, looking at what happens to what happens to trainees whose uh, scientific careers are paused for any reason. Um, you know, one. I guess it's not it's not a great side, but one um, aspect is that it is it is happening across the board. So we can make changes ac across the board. We can take um, considerations for for tenure clocks and other things um, across across the board. One of the specific requests that uh, the higher education associations made in that twenty six billion dollar uh, request was to fund additional. A graduate student postdoc fellowships, uh, traineeships, and and to really uh, focus on those early stage scientists for for two years because we really think that's going to be uh, important in in moving their their careers forward. We we should not and we cannot forget the impact that both the the pandemic and the, the situation that Ned discussed at the beginning. Um, with the concerns and the protests after the murder of George Floyd has had the extraordinary impact that these all of these are having on the personal lives of, of trainees, of investigators, of their families. And, uh, and so we do have, we do have to worry about a, a not, we're hoping not to have a lost generation of scientists, but those that we can focus on and help to recognize how this has impacted their career trajectories. Mm -hmm. And particularly amongst um, uh, perhaps underrepresented uh, classes of scientists, right? Uh, because you, you can imagine, you know, when you're in graduate school and there's that, that small stipend um, uh, when you've got to go away for uh, this three month period, 
you need that safety net, the support system to, to help that happen. So I appreciate yes. that. Thank you. Um, I, I think maybe we should turn a little bit towards uh, towards industry. We talked a, a lot about academia and about the NIH. Um, you know, once these discoveries are made, they've got to go through a technology transfer. Uh, and one of the questions that uh, I, we put on here just to keep you all engaged with me and, and with the rest of the, the, the team here uh, is about buy dole. So I'm going to put it, I'm going to try this polling thing again. Um, I'm always scared to do this. Um, all right. Uh, let's see how many of you are still with us. Before the buy dole Act became law in 1980, what percentage of new drugs were first introduced in the U.S.? Um, I'm doing my best Alex Trebek impersonation. Uh, if you all want to click into that. I see the numbers uh, coming in. All right, I'll, I'll close it there. And 46% of you said 10%, uh, and uh, about 40% of you said, uh, I'm sorry, 39% of you said 40%. Uh, and uh, you all are, are, are a, a very sophisticated group of people because you, uh, you, you know the answer that's less than 10% of new drugs were first introduced in the US uh, by the, uh, uh, before, uh, before 1980. Uh, in, uh, in the 2010s, over 60% were. So, uh, so quite, a, uh, quite a difference uh, based on, on that piece of legislation. Uh, when we discuss, continue this discussion, though, to say, you know, what is the significance of that pathway, and uh, are the public and private sector stepping up during this time to make use of some of these principles uh, to transfer intellectual property? You know, things like active, uh, uh, Jenny, that you mentioned. Uh, how are how are these coming together? How are we um, how are we uh, increasing collaboration uh, with industry? So. Um... One thing to keep in mind too is just, you know, if you look at the overall pie of, um, you know, biomedical and, and public health R&D in the U.S., industry is, you know, close to 70% of that investment, you know, with academia, um, you know, about 22%. And uh, patient groups and philanthropies and private research institutes are also a key part. So it's really important that we are able to get these um, innovations um, at their early stage and kind of their seed corn stage to get them out uh, to the to the private sector. And that's what Bidol and Stevenson Weidler allowed in 1980. And you know, if you talk to folks um, in the tech transfer world, and you know, Heather's um, members, her schools, they have tech transfer offices. Um, it is really the linchpin behind our tech transfer system. You know, without it, um, not only were we producing only 10% of the world's drugs, but only 5% of the government patents were making their way into some sort of a product. So, you know, items were literally sitting on the shelves. All that's changed. Um, and the the tech transfer framework that we have now has, has really allowed for elaboration um, and collaboration. Um, Autumn, which is the Association of University Tech um, Tech Managers, uh, they um, have come up with some guidelines uh, as well as some other uh, leading institutions like Harvard, MIT, and Stanford, which um, are allowing for their own IP to be distributed more broadly um, within COVID uh, to make sure that it gets out to patients. So that's all allowed, you know, under under the Bidol uh, framework. That's great. Um, others, uh, any any thoughts on on that that collaboration space between uh, between academia and industry? I mean, I might say a word. I, I you know was an academic, and I certainly uh, my lab found the ability to transfer technology very important when in academia, and it also is a you know tremendous support to the NCI, as mentioned from the, from the engineering uh, aspects that we have. I will say that um, it's a great law. It has really energized American biomedical research, but I think we have to continue to defend it because I think um, there's a bad PR story is developing about conflict of interest in American universities. That you know we're seeing these you know in the cancer world we had this report that like half the cancer center directors have COI, which is 
I think understandable and not necessarily a bad thing, but uh, it sounds bad to people. And particularly when they hear the uh, people involved in the clinical trials may have some conflict of interest and, or that the basic scientists can patent their invention uh, with, that seemingly with government funding and, and then go on and profit from that. And, and I think that's all good. I, I'm a fan of that and, and, and the NCI likes to see that happen. But we have to keep to explain to people why it's good, what, why it works that way, why that pathway makes sense, because uh, I think the American public keeps forgetting. And, um, and, and, and in particularly at a time like now where there's such immense pressure to see uh, basic science translated into rapid discovery, you know, every step of that process is going to get second guessed at some later date. And so it's very important right now that we do it in a way that's very above board, that, you know, def that, uh, that allows for close scrutiny and that really is with the best uh, intentions of benefiting the American public. Absolutely. And the, the, um, the importance of both defending Bidol, which has been phenomenally successful in getting treatment to the American public. I mean, that's, that's really the message that comes, that needs to come out and to, uh -huh. and to, uh, to educate, demystify the process. I think for for too long it has been. It appears that these that this pathway has been behind closed doors. Um, most most of that is because the different people have their heads down doing their doing their work. We have to remind uh, remind everyone that this is not a sector versus sector, government versus private industry versus academia conversation. Uh, you want to have the, you know, the manufacturing, the research, and the funding come from different places to a single goal to improve health. Uh, and so that that doesn't happen without without collaboration. But we do need to pull apart the the idea of what is a what is a collaboration, what is a a principled partnership, and an ethical single-minded movement on a single pathway. And how is that so different from what are very, very real um, problems in the past with financial relationships that were that were in financial entanglements that were made for the sole purpose of enriching an investigator or a or a doctor at the expense of the research? Those are very, very different things, and unfortunate that. So many of them have been, everything has been lumped together under conflict of interest. What we just need to do is be far more uh, transparent and not defensive about the relationships that are absolutely essential between academics, industry, and government agencies to get things moving, get them out the door, off the shelves uh, of the lab and onto the shelves uh, that where people can get to them. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. And, you know, Heather, um, I think you're thoughtful on this topic of transparency. Do you want to say anything about your vision of, uh, you know, better disclosure of conflict of interest and how, how would we, we operationalize that? I mean, that just turned out to be challenging to do. Yeah, it, it really is. Um, I think academic medicine has really, has been at the forefront of both, both, uh, the criticism and the, um, the ingenuity of trying to figure out what to do about this as a community. Um, we are fortunate to have Ned and many others come together last year to really talk about how across all sectors we can think about better disclosure for academic uh, relationships in biomedical journals to harmonize this so that it doesn't have to be such a tangled a tangled mess. We can we can use we can use common language, common forms, and have things be more public, more open, and use a common platform uh, to make to take the, to demystify those relationships. As as I've said to many many investigators and others, if you can't explain to someone confidently and easily why you have the relationship with this particular company and how that relationship benefits the uh, the public or the or global health, then maybe you shouldn't be having it. But if you can, there's no need to hide it or be worried about it. We'll just talk about it. So true, so true. Um, we're reaching the end of the part where I ask questions and we're gonna uh, enter the part where everybody else asks questions. I just wanna bring it back uh, to the patient uh, before we do that. Um, so for, uh, for all of you, uh, just briefly, uh, what 
you know, for 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 cancer patients, for uh, for patients of other chronic diseases and other uh, other acute diseases, what should they be taking away from uh, the research enterprise going forward after COVID? That there's a uh, a better clinical trial apparatus for them. That there is um, uh, that this is all coming back, and they're going to be able to enroll in clinical trials. What should they take away? As a patient, should I be worried about what COVID-19 has done to, uh, to the research enterprise? Uh, Ned, we'll start with you. Sure. I mean, I, I think um, one important thing we've begun to do an analysis of what we think the impact of the pandemic will be on cancer outcomes over the next decade because of changes in screening and care and deferred surgery and the the, the litany of things, and and it, it could be very significant. I mean, I think we're very modest assumptions about decreases in screening and decreases in elective surgeries and other procedures, you know, a, a very realistic scenario would be sort of a 1% excess cancer death over the next decade. And it could be worse than that if the disruption is longer or more significant than we plan on. So, you know, I, I think that the NCI has begun to think, you know, we let's all agree to not let that happen. We've seen, you know, decades of good progress in cancer mortality. I don't want to be the NCI director that sees the numbers start going back up again. You know, that, that's not something we would like to have happen. So, you know, what can we do working with our academic and uh, industry partners to try and assure that we catch up the missed screening and the missed care and that we reprioritize drug discovery and development for the new therapies that are getting stuck because of the parole and we, um, you know, learn these valuable lessons from the pandemic, you know, take these silver linings and implement them going forward. and that. That may be part of the solution. I think Congress is eager to help. I think that uh, you know um, both sides of the legislature of, of the legislature are enlightened in this topic and are are eager to understand what they can do to reinvigorate uh, cancer research and cancer care going forward. So um, you know this will be a special moment where we can really seize the opportunity because the pandemic has created the disruption of the way we function, and we should do that with the interest of patients in mind. Can uh, that 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 is uh, that's heartening. Uh, you're reminding me that um, the cancer rates have been coming down for a decade, and uh, uh, that, that that is such a uh, it's such a promising story, and we can't let it end. Um, others want to uh, talk about the just the effect on patients, or, or should we move on to the uh, to the questions of our audience? So, Deep, I'll I'll join in on that one. I think um, I, I would agree with everything that that Ned said. I think I would add um, when we're talking about partners. Um, be sure to think about the patient advocacy organizations in this because they they have a vital role in communicating with their constituents. They have a trusted role, and so um, you know while this has been a very scary time for all of us and for people who particularly who have chronic diseases and disabilities, um, uh, they there may be some opportunity. You know we were talking about silver linings. We call them bright spots. There may be some opportunities that come out of this that can really help the patient community. So whereas we had a very small percentage of people in this country who actually participate in clinical trials, we may have an opportunity for, for trials to be opened up to larger populations of people. Um, we may also have some better trials, some, some trials that are not quite so complex and um, can be less burdensome to patients, which actually makes recruitment easier, it makes um, completion easier. So, you know, all of those bright spots, I think, can be enhanced if we have some better communication and partnership. Um, taking the patient advocacy community into consideration and doing things in partnership with them to help reach the patient community and to help listen to the kinds of research that that community is looking for. Thank you. Thank you, Eleanor. All right. Uh, with that, thank you all for that uh, for that that great discussion. I'm going to turn to questions from the uh, from the audience, and I have uh, uh, quite a few here. So um, uh, I apologize. I can only see one at a time, so they may not seem like they're grouped together very well. Uh, uh, so the first is uh, just wondering if remote patient monitoring technology can aid in research to monitor the metrics that researchers are looking for, but not in person. For example, pulse ox temperature, etc. Uh, have you all seen this um, uh, uh, increase in remote patient monitoring, uh, monitoring technology? Uh, I'll speak to that. Oh, yeah. You know, I mean, I, I think uh, remote monitoring is really having a special moment because of the pandemic. I think it's tremendous interest in how you can use novel sources of data that are patient associated via apps and you know, web based platforms to learn about what's going on in a population. And I, I think that. Um, 
you know, and the technology is really uh, moving at an incredible pace. So I, I am on um, part of the uh, sort of oversight board of the RADx program, which is to use novel diagnostics uh, for pandemic, uh, you know, diagnosis, and and it's uh, it's very impressive. I mean, the the, uh, the the kinds of data you can get from relatively low cost devices that are available to patients in the home, with maybe nothing more than a smartphone as as extra, is uh, I think a, a really interesting opportunity for a, lot, a variety of public health challenges. We had just sort of started in that space in cancer, but I think uh, the pandemic is really going to accelerate our interest in this area because what we're learning from you know, virology monitoring also will apply to malignancy. And I would just say anything that enhances the opportunity for patients to be involved and engaged and takes the burden off of them is very welcome by the patient community. And um, you know, I think in the past there were some fears about technology that patients wouldn't be engaged, they'd be afraid of it. And I think we're long past that, and I think it's very welcome. Thank you. I think just the fact that we're here on a, on a video conference is, is testimony that I'm overcoming my technological fears. <laughs> I, I, I would add, I would say that the, that was. Go ahead, Heather. I, I would add, I think all of these are advantages and can be used uh, can be used properly and helpfully. We need to be very, very aware uh, that that these um, advances in technology in technology don't inadvertently increase disparities that we have in participation in research and who is who is recruited or seen as easily recruitable and who benefits from from the research. So we just re need to make sure that we do not create a technological disparity in the um, in the wake of this pandemic. Yeah, I, I would add to that because this is it's a really critical point. Um, we think about disparities, I think, in very traditional ways, but um, you know, it's the disparity of someone who may not have access to a particular technology because of the cost aspects or because of where they live and bandwidth and things like that. But but it can also cause um, us to have disparities in terms of people who have disabilities who may not be able to use some of these technologies because of disability. And so we need to think very seriously about um, some of the the, the the disadvantages that that might happen and, and that has to be given careful thought but I, I do think that the potential is is so great that we can overcome some of those things we just have to be as Heather said very very conscientious about them thank you um, I'll go to the next question here and this is a, this is going back to the the, the personnel in the workforce um, are there any estimates on how this pandemic is going to affect the trainee and, and workforce pipeline um, I'm thinking about the collective group of individuals who are either already leaving the field, not coming into the U.S. Uh, because of immigration issues, uh, and uh, those who will probably who probably won't make it long term due to the continued adverse impacts of COVID-19. So um, that's a collective group. It's not any any one of those groups. Any anyone have any? Uh, are there any estimates out there, or is it just a a, a collective worry? We're accumulating those data now. So uh, Oliver Bogler, who runs the Center for Cancer Training at the NCI, has been calling all the, the, the fundees and the various you know institutions that have institutional training grants and trying to really work out what this is going to cost the NCI in a you know to the third decimal point kind of estimate. Uh, you know, it's going to be significant. You you can think about like a like take for example a, a, a standard K99 R00 award. That award is built that you do two years of K99 and then three years of R00. And if six months of your K99 is disrupted, then you have to add that on. And that becomes a five and a half year award, not a five year award. And that um, that's you know a significant cost to the, to the grant. So um, we are uh, more than just worried. We're starting to actually figure out what it's gonna cost. But I think, um, you know, training is a big part of what we do. It's maybe one of the most important things the NCI does. I think it's an area where we've had a lot of success over the last few years in, in, in getting innovative, great new cancer, you know, great people into cancer biology. Uh, but I, I really hope that um, you know, someone before you already used the, the, the expression of sort of the lost generation of early stage researchers and we really can't let that happen. Uh, Jenny, I, I see you're trying to talk. I don't hear you. Oh, 
I'm sorry, Jenny, we can't hear you. Um, I will come back to you when you when you when you find your uh, find your microphone. Um, in the meantime, I think I'll uh, uh, move on to the next question here. It's a couple of questions about COVID-19. Um, I'll throw these out there. These might be uh, not not exactly on our uh, on our topic, but they're they are interesting about collaboration. Uh, one says, can someone describe what what Operation Warp Speed is and how it's related to Active? Um, uh, they feel like both uh, collaborations, but uh, but of different types. Uh, and, uh, could um, anyone able to, to tackle that one? That's a tough one, I think. For this sure, I, I can try and handle that. Um, Active is a NIH public-private partnership run with a number of uh, industry partners. Uh, you know, the NIH has a lot of experience doing public-private partnerships, and uh, this one never quite this fast. I mean, this is a new new ground for us, but uh, a really important ability to partner with uh, the people who have many of the relevant molecules and vaccine approaches. Active has three parts. It has a vaccine arm. It has a sort of, which is, uh, you know, largely involving uh, several of the partners that have uh, vaccine candidates. It has sort of a small molecule, molecule and antibody therapeutics arm. And that's what Janet Whitecock has stepped away from the FDA to run. And then it has a diagnostic slash devices arm, and that's, I already alluded to RADx, which is one of the major features of that from the NIH point of view, but also has great industry participation. Uh, that structure that the NIH started standing up um, fit very nicely with the White House vision, uh, the administration's vision of how to accelerate uh, COVID research. And that's the thing that became Operation Warp Speed that Monsef Salawi was brought in to sort of steer. And uh, I think that interaction has been very good. So, so the um, the three buckets is the same, you know, diagnostics, uh, therapeutics, and vaccines. And but it includes, uh, you know, across government, so the DoD as well as HHS, and the ability then to use like DoD operations and infrastructure capabilities to accelerate clinical trials approval, for example. So it gives some oomph to the effort that I think the NIH wouldn't have on its own. So uh, it's really important. I think. What we're seeing is the uh, U.S. government is all in on COVID clinical trials and clinical development, and and I think having that level of involvement uh, at you know multiple cabinet secretaries as well as the White House is really uh, helpful when you want to get a uh, clinical trial started, for example. Thank you, Ned. Uh, that was a great question because I, I, I'll be honest, it, it's hard for us on the outside to to be able to tell you know, the acronyms from the uh, uh, from the cool names. So I, I appreciate that. Um, uh, this one uh, is for uh, for Eleanor. Uh, what suggestions do you have for Congress to help patient groups that are focused on research for specific low interest diseases, such as bladder cancer or rare cancer diseases? Um, you know, what's the uh, uh, what are the what are the right ways to uh, to con to um, to communicate with Congress about those? Eleanor. Well, I think. One of the things that we've been doing is just communicating in general um, with Congress and, and folks on the Hill um, and in the administration um, about the plight right now of the patient advocacy organizations like many of the not for profits that are out there. Um, it's not only um, their events being canceled because of COVID-19, but it's also the economic downturn. And so um, any organization that relies on charitable contributions, which then in turn goes on to fund research, um, you know, we have questions about whether many of those organizations will be able to exist after this year. Um, and many of them, you may already know, are experiencing uh, staff furloughs and, and layoffs um, at very high numbers uh, because of what's happening. And so um, we've been communicating uh, with uh, the Hill that, um, they, that in terms of thinking about um, any kind of programs to help in the economic downturn and to provide any kind of support that it we make sure that it includes not-for-profit organizations and especially patient advocacy groups because at this time, um, along with COVID-19, uh, they have more stress and pressure on their organizations to provide more services to their constituents because of COVID-19. So it's a double-edged sword. Um, they, they've been very responsive and um, patient advocacy organizations and other not-for-profits have been included in things like the PPP loan program um, and, and things like that. We, we'd like for that to go further and for there to be some specific consideration. Um, and I think in terms of the research aspect, um, if it isn't to relief to the patient advocacy organizations, it could be in thinking about how they might go about uh, planning for some 
supporting some of that kind of research that might fall by the wayside because of these groups not being able to continue their support for the next couple of years. Thank you, Honor. Uh, any others uh, want to tackle that one? That's, a, that's always a tough one. All right, uh, moving on to uh, uh, the lack, the difference between R&D innovation and uh, consumer education. So uh, in healthcare or uh, food agriculture innovation, we seem to continue to lead with R&D and innovation, but lag on consumer education. Uh, and you know, trust in the pharmaceutical sector and innovation continues to be an opportunity. I think that's being polite. Um, uh, the, the questioner would like to uh, wel would welcome your thoughts on uh, what the private and public sector must do to enhance trust in uh, these innovations and trust in our communications. Uh, thoughts on that? COVID-19 has definitely shown us, um, uh, you know, what what can happen when there isn't trust in that communication. Um, okay. if I, I'll take a I'll take a turn at that. Um, you know, one of the really worrisome signs right now are polls showing um, the the number of Americans who uh, would not take a COVID-19 vaccine if it, you know, once it's developed. And among Black Americans, there's even a greater number. Um, that's a lack of a trust um, in, in many cases. You know, we, we've got to build that back up. Um, you know, we've had vaccine uh, hesitancy, vaccine confidence, anti-vax, um, you know, a whole slew of um, sort of uh, retaliation or um, resistance to vaccination growing um, as we've seen with the measles epidemic. Uh, but right now we are, this is um, a critical time. I mean, we're so focused on getting a vaccine as we should be. There are, you know, dozens of candidates, uh, but if we can't get people to feel comfortable um, taking that vaccine, we're just not going to get our country started again. So that's just an absolutely critical issue. Uh, I don't have the answer right now. I do have some thoughts. It would take a lot longer than what we have right now, but I think that question is right on. Uh, and particularly since we are doing things so quickly, um, you know, on one hand, we want to tackle this foe uh, of COVID-19 quickly, but we want to make sure that we're not doing so in a, in a way that undermines uh, public confidence um, in the safety and, and efficacy of what, what comes from it. I think yes. the, uh, yeah. the need for education really underscores how in the face of this pandemic, we need to have a uh, an approach that incorporates the, the biomedical healthcare delivery approach and the public health uh, approach. And so the questions as to, you know, how are the vaccines, how are the diagnostic tests being developed, what kinds of treatments are available, uh, needs to be moving forward at, at a, a high rate of speed. At the same time, we need, we need a constant public education and messaging that says, that helps people understand, here's why it's important for, that we're doing a testing of asymptomatic people. You don't, we should, we're not testing you because you feel sick. That's a different piece. That's a healthcare piece. Um, but we need to be testing broadly to, to be able to understand where this virus is, how it's affecting what geographic areas, and to pave the way now for whenever hopefully there is a vaccine that's effective and readily available at a, at low or no cost um, but until that happens we know right now what those numbers are those statistics that jenny mentioned which are which are very scary um, because that means you know we could have a a scientific breakthrough a healthcare delivery success that is a an absolute failure from a public health standpoint, and we won't have conquered this vaccine, uh, this uh, virus, and allowed us to move on if we don't have both happening at the same time. Uh, I, I want to jump in on that, too, because I agree with everything that's been said, um, and I think, uh, of course, communication and education will be very valuable, and the one recommendation that I would make is that we think about doing some of these things a little bit differently than we have in the past and that we engage the patient community. We do the kind of work with um, understanding um, how, how, how best to reach them, how to communicate this um, information, um, understanding what their needs are, and understanding um, from their perspective what's the best way to communicate and educate 
Um, I think we have a history of um, going off behind closed doors, developing what, what we think are beautiful, wonderful um, educational programs, and then we are so surprised when we find out that they fail, and it's because we never actually um, had any patients with us along the way trying to point out that you know, these words don't make sense to me, or um, th this uh, graphic doesn't make sense to me, or whatever the things are. And if we can do it collaboratively with patients and in a patient-centered way, then I think we have a chance of being more successful. Thank you. Um, I'm going to, we're, we're close to the end of our time. I'm going to wrap up with one last question for Ned. Um, you know, I, there's, we've been talking about the effects of COVID-19 and, and all of that, but uh, the reason why we want to get things restarted is that we want to see those innovations in, in cancer therapies. Um, what's the, if, you, if I had to ask you about the one or two things that you're most excited about uh, that are making their way through the, the cancer pipeline, uh, what would those be? And, and give us a, give us a reason to, to put all of our energy into advocacy and into uh, into research and development. Well, look, I mean, had, had the pandemic not happened, re, despite the pandemic, I think this is going to be one of the great years ever for new medicine approvals in cancers. You know, it's I, I think the FDA is at the like 25 new molecules they've approved this year for uh, cancer therapy. I mean, I, I lost count. It's a staggering productivity. I mean, they, I, I'm old enough to remember when like a new drug a year was considered pretty good productivity. And now, and some of these drugs are phenomenally active. Um, you know, really, I mean, curative therapy for metastatic disease or very, you know, year, five years of disease-free survival. So quite, quite good therapies. But if you look at what they all, all of them are for a couple of percent of cancer, right? It's, it's this specific kind of lung cancer, this specific kind of breast cancer. And so the, 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 the most important change to the thinking in cancer research over the last 20 years has been the realization that cancer is not one disease, but it's hundreds or thousands of diseases. And they each need their own special tailored precision oncology approach. And once we really bought into that paradigm and said, okay, we're not gonna have a silver bullet for all cancer, we're going to have to take these one by one. Uh, then we really have started to make a lot of progress. So that that paradigm is going to play out. I mean, we just now we have so many new drugs approved so quickly that we now have this problem of like, how do you put them together and use them in sequence or combination? Or so I, I like to say that I, I think if we had no new approvals for the next decade, we'd still make a lot of progress because we just have to you know maximize the clinical utility of these agents. Um, but you know so. That's a real challenge for us because obviously there are not enough patients to do all the possible combinations. So we have to be very smart and lean and efficient at our clinical trial design to get maximally informative trials to give us an answer as quickly as possible. So that's what I think is most exciting is just, you know, the, the engine works. The cancer research enterprise is, uh, you know, we just have to sort of sit back and watch the magic happen now and figure out how to uh, prioritize those things and put them together and, and maximize patient benefit. And of course, do it in a way that is, equitable, where we can provide care for all Americans with cancer, not just rich Americans. But, you know, drug prices are a real concern in our field. But uh, nonetheless, I think the um, it's a staggeringly productive time. And so what's keeping me up at night is just how do we get back to that? You know, how do, how do we make sure that uh, we can re resume operations of the cancer research enterprise to the extent that was happening prior to March 2020? Well, thank you for that. You know, that is incredibly inspiring uh, to those of us who are uh, patients and those of us who are advocates and those of us who are in the research enterprise, knowing uh, that it's not just about test tubes and uh, and um, pipettes. It's about uh, patients who are going to uh, who are actually going to be better uh, because of the research that's going on in the research enterprise. And uh, you know, as I as I sort of think about what's the bottom line from today, it's that it is an absolute imperative. That we get the um, the NIH funded, the Academic Medical Center uh, executed, the industry executed research, uh, that whole entire enterprise working, not just one piece of it, uh, and what that means for advocates, which is that we have a we have a we have a lot of things to do. Uh, we have a whole lot to do. And as a, a, a board member of Research America, I just want to want to let you know that Research America and the team there uh, stand ready to work with all of you on how we raise the bar and keep health and medical innovation at the forefront of our nation's policy, policy initiatives because that's where it belongs. Uh, we want to make sure that Ned and his team at NCI, uh, that the folks at the medical centers and the folks at universities and research centers around the country are able to help patients. So uh, thank you all for uh, a great conversation. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did, and, uh, and I hope everyone has a great rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you.